the course is predicated on a theory of knowledge that suggests that we classify objects and situations according to two separate types of schemes. And the first type of scheme is one that everyone is essentially familiar with. Uh, that's the scientific scheme that makes the presupposition that there's an objective world that's apprehensible to the senses that can be collectively described, which is only to say that the thing is real. If you can sense it, which usually means if you can touch it most fundamentally or see it or in some other way detect it, if you can describe the procedures by which that detection occurred, and if someone else duplicating those procedures comes up with the same observations. And that's a real thing. That's a fact. It's a scientific fact. And we've been able to codify a methodology for determining what is from the objective perspective. And I don't think there's, there's no real reason to dispute that. It seems more or less self-evident. It's a relatively new procedure. We've only been really good at it for 500 years at the most. It's only been that long since the scientific enterprise has been transformed into something that was actually codified. It's obviously an extraordinarily efficient way to proceed. And there's no point, in a sense, in debating its utility. That's one type of um, knowledge scheme. But there's another type that people have spent much less time formalizing, partly because it's more difficult to formalize, but with regards to the scientific method, we more or less have a set of agreed upon rules by which the endeavor should proceed, and also by which to judge the validity of the outcomes of the procedures. You can write them down. They're very much formalized. That's why almost anybody can do scientific research, especially the type of scientific research that Thomas Kuhn described as normal, which basically means that you have a set theory which you're not trying to challenge. You're working within the theory to more or less flesh it out. So you're a, a technician putting to work potent technical tools that you can virtually do by rote. Anyways, we figured out how to formalize that. That's an answer to the question, what is? How to control things? The second type of information, that's the type that I'm concerned with in this course. And that is not what a thing is from the objective perspective, but about what it is from the perspective of determining its implications for behavior. You say, well, there are things, and there is also knowledge about how to behave in their presence. The first kind of information we might consider <coughs> the second kind of information is more akin to what has been traditionally described as wisdom. Because wisdom is the knowledge of how to conduct yourself. Uh, things exist, and the fact of their existence has implications for behavior. And it's the implications of the existence of things for behavior that I want to focus on. Because in our social communities, we come to agreements over vast stretches of time about what sorts of behaviors are to be considered appropriate, in which situations, and under which conditions. And it's this agreement that lends predictability to our interpersonal relationships. We can take an example just of this course. Uh, we all share a map, so to speak, of what behaviors are appropriate in a situation like this. And essentially what that means is that we can come in here and conduct our business, and we all know what that business is going to be. There's no dispute about that. And we all know, more or less, what our respective roles are going to be in conducting that business. There's no, re there's no space for dispute at all, which basically means that our shared map of the significance of the events that are occurring in this room eliminates the need for conflict. We don't even have, we don't have to fight about what's going to happen here. We don't have to fight about who owns that sun-kissed orange juice, or who's going to take control of the pens, or who owns that particular computer, or who's going to, or how the, how the discussion is going to proceed. That's all mapped out for us in some ways. And that means that we've rendered ourselves in this particular situation predictable, which means that there's no reason for any of us to regard any of the other people in the room with any sort of apprehension whatsoever. So in a sense, you could say that for me, you're a fixed object in terms of your significance in this environment. And the reason for that is because we're engaging in a culturally determined process. 
none of which we're questioning, or at least that we've, we've accepted implicitly, well, explicitly and implicitly. You're at a university. This is what happens at a university. You know that. I know that. We don't have to set any of the ground <coughs> rules. Well, it's our shared apprehensions about the implications of situations for behaviors that constitute our cultures. And it's those shared maps that bring predictability to our interpersonal relationships. And what that essentially, you can only understand that if you understand what the world is like when it's not predictable. And it's difficult to understand that for modern people who live in peaceful times because our culture is so successful at regulating our interpersonal behavior, and even the environment for that matter, that we hardly ever encounter a situation where anything remotely unpredictable happens. So you can't tell what it's like to be faced with something that's unpredictable. So you don't know what it's like when you're in an environment where culture doesn't reign, because you're part of a successful community and you're extraordinarily well protected. You're like, you're like a, a boy that lives inside a castle. You can't see over the walls, it doesn't even know that they're there. There's all sorts of terrible things outside the castle, but everything inside is peaceful. And that's the world. And the boy has no idea what he would be like if he went outside into the real world where things were actually unpredictable because he's only had a chance to observe his behavior under stable conditions where everything's predictable and acceptable. It's even worse now in a sense. It's better in a way too. I mean, it is peaceful now in many ways. I mean, even compared to 15 years ago, there's much less ideological dispute in the world about how to conduct affairs than there was, say, in the, in the mid-70s. And people have more or less, I mean, I know there's exceptions to this, but people the world over have more or less accepted the necessity, for example, for a market economy. There aren't very many ideologies that appear attractive, even in the imagination, in contrast to, to Western-style democracies. And I mean, that's a pretty recent occurrence, and it's unlikely to last for any great length of time, I think, but, but it is peaceful now. And, and that, that, the fact that that piece makes it even more difficult for us to either to understand ourselves or to be sufficiently motivated to understand ourselves. You know? Because when things are going really well and everything's predictable, then you presume that you know what you're doing. In fact, that's the basis on which you, ju you base your judgments about whether you know what you're doing. If you perform a procedure and what you predicted occurs, you're right. Now, that doesn't mean you know everything, but as far as you're concerned, that's sufficient. So, anyways fundamental point is this. We share a map of the significance of things and situations, including other people, including ourselves. And that maps our culture. And one of the lines of arguments that I want to develop throughout the course of this course is that that shared culture takes the form of a story. In fact, that's what a story is. A story is a description of the significance of situations or events for behavior. And a story is the kind of information, a story is a form of information that transmits abstractly knowledge about how to act. So you have, on the one hand, scientific descriptions. They're descriptions of facts, things that are sensory apprehensible to a collective. And you have another form of information, that's narrative. And a narrative contains information about how you should conduct yourself. Literally, how you should propel your body through space under which circumstances. And a shared narrative constitutes a culture. 